Empowerment Technologies Magandang morning, mga estudyente, nang esti, PCIC, at ESE. We will now proceed with our lesson for today. For today's lesson we are going to tackle the Lesson 1, Introduction to Information and Communication Technologies, the State of ICT Technologies, Online Systems, Functions, and Platforms. At the end of the lesson, the students should be able to 1. Improve their knowledge on how ICT affects their everyday lives and the state of our nation. 2. Compare and contrast the differences between online platforms, sites, and content. 3. Understand the feature of Web 2.0. 4. Understand the feature of the World Wide Web through Web 3.0 and 5. Learn the different trends in ICT and use them to their advantage. Introduction to Information and Communication Technologies, ICT, deals with the use of different communication technologies such as mobile phones, telephone, internet, etc. to locate, save, send, and edit information. When we make a video call, we use internet. When we send a text or make a call, we use cellular networks. When we run out of load or battery, we use payphones which use a telephone network. Having a unified way to communicate is one of the goals of ICT. In terms of economics, ICT has saved companies a lot of resources, time and money, with the kind of communication technology they use nowadays. In a similar way, we spend less because of ICT. As it normally costs us a peso to send a text message or SMS, with the internet, we can send multiple messages and only be charged by a fraction. ICT is the abbreviation for Information and Communication Technology. ICT is an umbrella term used to encompass all rapidly emerging, evolving and converging computer, software, networking, telecommunications, internet, programming and information systems technologies. Today we are going to discuss what is information and communication technology, its terminologies and how are we able to use its terms for us to practice in the next lesson. What is Information and Communication Technology, ICT? ICT is a composite term, which embodies three important concepts. To understand ICT, one must understand all three concepts. Information means many things to people, depending on the context. Scientifically, information is a process data. Information can also be loosely defined as that which aids decision making. Information, though abstract, could also be visualized as a commodity, which could be or solid. Any potentially useful fact, quantity or value that can be expressed uniquely with exactness. Information is whatever is capable of causing a human myth to change its opinion about the current state of the world. Communication refers to the transfer or exchange of information from person to person or from one place to another. When action produces a reaction, whether positive or negative, communication has taken place. Other writers in the field of communication studies have defined communication as process a transfer of information, ideas, thoughts and messages. It involves a sender, a receiver, a code and a language that is understood by both the sender and receiver. Technology refers to the use of scientific knowledge to invent tools that assist human beings in their efforts to overcome environmental hazards and impediments to comfort. In this regard, technology refers to the things like computer, telephone, cell phone, GSM handsets, television, radio, etc. Information and communication, technology, put together, therefore, ICT has been defined as the acquisition, analysis, manipulation, storage and distribution of information, and the design and provision of equipment and software. ICT in the Philippines 
several international companies dump the Philippines as the ICT hub of Asia. It is no secret that there is a huge growth of ICT-related jobs around the country, one of which is the call center or BPO, business process outsourcing, centers. According to the 2013 edition of Measuring the Information Society by the International Telecommunication Union, there are 106.8 cell phones per 100 Filipinos in the year 2012. That would mean that for every 100 Filipinos you meet, there is a high chance that they have a cell phone and approximately for the 7 of them, they have 2. In a data gathered by the Annual Survey of the Philippine Business and Industries, NSO, in 2010, the ICT industry shares 19.3% of the total employment population here in the Philippines. To add to the statistics, Time magazine's The Selfie Cities Around the World of 2014 places two cities from the Philippines in the top one and top nine spots. The study was conducted using Instagram, a popular photo-sharing application. With the numbers, there is no doubt that the Philippines is one of the countries that benefits most out of ICT.
Web 2.0 Dynamic Web Pages The Internet has been a vital tool to our modern lives that is why it is also important to take the best of the Internet. When the World Wide Web was invented, most web pages were static. Static, also known as flat page of stationary page, in the sense that the page is as is, and cannot be manipulated by the use. The content is also the same for all the users. This is referred to as the Web 1.0. However, the World Wide Web is more than just static pages. Pretty soon, Web 2.0 came into the picture. Web 2.0 is a term coined by Darcy DiNucci on January 1999. In her article title, Fragmented Future, she wrote, The web we know now, which loads into a browser window in essentially static screenfuls, is only an embryo of the web to come. The first glimmerings of Web 2.0 are beginning to appear, and we are just starting to see how that embryo might develop. Web 2.0 is the evolution of Web 1.0 by adding dynamic web pages, the user is able to see a website differently than others. Examples of Web 2.0 include social networking sites, blogs, wikis, video sharing sites, hosted services, and web applications. Web 2.0 also allows users to use web browsers instead of just using their operating system. Browsers can now be used for their user interface, application software, or web application, and even for file storage. Most websites that we visit today are Web 2.0. Features of Web 2.0 The key features of Web 2.0 include 1. Folksonomy allows users to categorize and classify a range information using freely chosen keywords, for example tagging. Popular networking sites such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. use tags that start with the pound sign, pound. This is also referred to as hashtag. 2. Rich user experience, content is dynamic and is responsive to users' input. An example would be a website that shows local content. In the case of social networking sites, when logged on, your account is used to modify what you see in their website. 3. User participation, the owner of the website is not the only one who is able to put content. Others are able to place a content of their own by means of comments, reviews, and evaluation. Some websites allow readers to comment on an article, participate in a poll, or review a specific product, for example Amazon.com, online stores. 4. Long tail, services that are offered on demand rather than a one-time purchase. In certain cases, time-based pricing is better than file size pricing or vice versa. This is synonymous to subscribing to a data plan that charges you for the amount of time you spend in the internet, or a data plan that charges you for the amount of bandwidth you used. 5. Software as a service, users will subscribe to a software only when needed rather than purchasing them. This is a cheaper option if you do not always need to use a software. For instance, Google Docs is a free web-based application that allows the user to create and edit word processing and spreadsheet documents online. When you need a software, like a word processor, you can purchase it for a one-time huge amount and install it in your computer and it is yours forever. Software as a service allows you to rent a software for a minimal fee. 6. Mass participation, diverse information sharing through universal web access. Since most users can use the Internet, Web 2.0's content is based on people from various cultures. Hi, my name is Jerome, and today we're going to be talking about the evolution of the web. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and Web 3.0. The first generation of the web is called Web 1.0. Okay, so the websites built during this time was very, very simple. Okay, so mostly our text and if you see some images, it doesn't have yet a, a high resolution. So especially that during that time, 
uh, our internet speed is not as fast as what we have today okay so the web 1.0 lasted from 1989 to 2005 it was considered a read-only website actually it was known to be a static website okay so static in a way where you know web masters or web developer developers just uh, publish their content online and users uh, just passively receive the information okay there was no way to react or make uh, reviews and feedback making some comments or reactions or writing your opinions about the post just like what we have today yeah it doesn't exist yet during the time yeah things like uh, liking features like what we have in YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or putting some uh, reactions yeah it uh, it was not a feature yet during uh, during the time of web 1.0 okay so the interaction between the websites and the users were very very limited okay so uh, again now uh, during the web 1.0 users doesn't have the opportunity to uh, make some comments reactions or any kind of feedback now let's move on to web 2.0 or the dynamic websites okay so what do we mean by that so unlike web 1.0 web 2.0 now allow users to be able to respond to the website okay that is why it is dynamic so uh, if, if for example a reader uh, for a certain blog uh, has an opinion about it he, he or she can write some comments right on the page uh, so users now are able to make their own post within the page not just comments in fact users who are able to uh, make an entire page okay uh, this happens through blogging platforms web 2.0 is the second phase of web development uh, uh, users are now able to interact not only on the website but also the I mean there was also an interaction among users okay so the web 2.0 facilitated the sharing of contents this feature flooded the World Wide Web with all types of contents on uh, almost any subject matter uh, that we know okay so web 2.0 was a huge explosion almost any content that you wanted to search from the internet is already available from various sources okay you know things like fashion food travel cooking music lifestyle fitness and health online courses history politics you name it so the web is dominating when it comes to content All right, a few examples of Web 2.0 are Facebook, Wikipedia, Twitter, WordPress, Instagram, and so on. Okay, almost all websites that you see today on the internet are product of Web 2.0. Users are now more involved to information being published in the internet. Unlike Web 1.0, the type of data that can be published in Web 2.0 is more robust. Okay, not only text and images but also large files such as videos can now easily be shared and circulated worldwide all right so now let's move on to web 3.0 you might have noticed that in your smartphone facebook is notifying you that somebody posted a photo that might include you or you know some apps in your smartphone are aware of your current location okay you know the, the gps app or even the uh, uh, google map is actually tracking your uh, location real time okay while you're driving the car and the web will now in web 3.0 the web will now process data and information based on the needs of users okay uh, in web 2.0 users must explicitly look for the information that they're trying to search all right they, they need to put some key uh, a, a very, they need to put a very accurate keywords in order to be able to search the information that they're looking for okay 
but uh, the web but web 2.0 doesn't care why you are searching for that information or why you are buying a certain product online but in web 3.0 it's different okay the web now cares about the information that you're trying to search the web 3.0 now cares about the product you purchase online what information you normally seek how often do you seek for a particular information it can anticipate what products or information you might need in the future okay it knows your location it's it is aware about your online behavioral pattern and you know processing all this information in order for the computer to be able to make some suggestions for you all right so let's take a look with this example uh, from expertssystem.com in web 3.0 while you are driving a car you can simply ask i would like to watch a romantic movie and eat japanese food okay so the search engine embedded in the car assistant provides you with a personalized response that takes into account your location suggesting the closest cinema that matches your request and a good japanese restaurant by automatically consulting the reviews on social media then it might even present a 3d menu from the restaurant in the display if you will notice web 3.0 is now personalized because the web now analyzes your behavioral pattern online okay it it will try to anticipate your needs uh it takes into account your location your behavioral pattern your preferred products and services and those things that you prefer will be on top of the list so unlike web 2.0 uh, the things that are on top of your search result are basically the things that are most searched by most users on the internet web 3.0 is characterized by machine learning automation and artificial intelligence Okay, I hope you have learned something today. Thank you for watching. Web 3.0 and the Semantic Web The Semantic Web is a movement led by the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. The W3C standard encourages web developers to include semantic content in their web pages. The term was coined by the inventor of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners Lee. Lee also noted that the Semantic Web is a component of Web 3.0. According to the W3C, the semantic web provides a common framework that allows data to be shared and reused across application, enterprise, and community boundaries. The aim of Web 3.0 is to have machines, or servers, understand the user's preferences to be able to deliver web content specifically targeting the user. For example, when doing a web search in Web 2.0, the topmost result is based on the preference of several users who already searched for the item. The search engine then labels it the most common answer to the search query. Though there are instances wherein several preferences are considered like geographic location, Web 3.0 aims to do better. This is through studying personal preferences of an individual user and showing results based on those preferences. The internet is able to predict the best possible answers to your question by learning from your previous choices. For example, if you search the internet for, where is the best place to go shopping? Web 3.0 will aim to give you results depending on how you have made choices in the past. If you purchase several shoes online, the internet will give you results on the best place with the highest rated shoes around your vicinity. Another example is when you search for the best restaurant to visit in a specific area. First, it may look for your previous visits from another restaurant and if you have rated them whether good or bad. In return, Web 3.0 will search for restaurants that have a similar menu, good rating, and budget that fit your preference in the past. Web 3.0 is yet to be fully realized because of several problems. One. Compatibility, HTML files and current web browsers could not support Web 3.0. 2. Security, the user's security is also in question since the machine is saving his or her preferences. 3. Vastness, the World Wide Web already contains billions of web pages. 4. Vagueness, 
certain words are imprecise. The words old and small would depend on the user. 5. Logic. Since machines use logic, there are certain limitations for a computer to be able to predict what the user is referring to at a given time. Hey! Being aware of the numerous advancements in technology is not an easy task, but fortunately, during the next few minutes you will obtain crucial information on one of the biggest upcoming revolutions, the Web 3.0, as well as great tips on how to be aware of the newest upcoming technology. But what does all this web nonsense have to do with me, you might ask yourself. Well, you would actually be surprised. Just take a look around. You'll be able to find a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone beside you, or even all of them. Just tell me, what will you do if all your Facebook information gets lost? Or if somebody steals your email password? I would go crazy! Currently, information is not just a bunch of bits anymore. It's actually becoming an extension of ourselves. So, what is the Web 3.0? The Web 3.0 is the upcoming web revolution, the semantic web, a personalizable place with intelligent search and behavioral advertisements where content is generated by machines rather than by humans, where virtual items or information become more valuable than physical items, where we'll get a tweet telling us if our boss is on time or even if our food is going out of date in the fridge. Ew. Oh, does that mean that the web has been evolving? Exactly. Remember many years ago, when Google just launched, YouTube was just coming out, and MSN Messenger used to be the thing? <laughs> oh yeah, totally forgot about that. Well, those were part of the first web generation, or Web 1.0. The web then began to evolve into a much more dynamic web. Technologies like RSS, Ajax, and XML started coming up. Content management systems were replaced by wikis. Blogs became more common than diaries, and social media became an essential tool for every single individual, creating what we now know as the Web 2.0. Currently, innovative technologies like the Google Glass project, augmented reality, and advanced mobile technologies are what makes this third generation of Web possible. Wow, where can I get this Web 3.0? You actually interact with several Web 3.0 technologies every day. Smartphones, for example, are one of the biggest factors in this revolution. Incredible 4G speeds, retina displays, and technologies like cloud computing improve the web experience massively. Studies have even shown that people are tending towards using their smartphone or tablet more than their actual computers. We can even see this revolution in computers. Take Windows 8, for example, which is trying very hard to adapt to the tablet market. Web 3.0 also allows a thing we call hyperconnectivity. What this really means is that everything is starting to be interconnected through the internet. There are already twice as many devices connected to the internet than people in the world. And it is set to increase to 6.5 per person by 2020. That sounds amazing! Hey, and can my business benefit from all this? Definitely! Businesses benefit from the Web 3.0 in numerous ways. They're not only discovering new novel ways of using social media for marketing, but they are making use of technologies such as Ruby on Rails, Python's Django, and Hadoop to scale their businesses massively through the internet by selling software as services instead of as products. So what you're saying is that the Web 3.0 is perfect? As you might know, nothing can be perfect. With many new technologies coming up, powerful malware and harmful software comes along. The web is advancing so fast that some security protocols are not catching up, leaving loopholes which hackers can then exploit. Also, with the massive increase of value on virtual information, there is also an increasing concern, as its protection becomes much more crucial for everyone. Trends in ICT As the world of ICT continues to grow, the industry had focused on several innovations. These innovations cater to the needs of the people that benefit most out of ICT. Whether it is for business or personal use, these trends are the current frontrunners in the innovation of ICT. 1. Convergence Technological convergence is the synergy of technological advancements to work on a similar goal or task. For example, besides using your personal computer to create Word documents, you can now use your smartphone. It can also use cloud technologies to sync files from one device to another while using LTE technology which means you can access your files anytime, anywhere. 
Convergence is using several technologies to accomplish a task conveniently. On distributed systems, we're going to look at the somewhat inverse phenomena of technology convergence in this video. We'll talk about how technology has evolved through a process of increased differentiation and specialization, but how over the past few decades, information technology and service design are enabling the phenomena of mass convergence as disparate technologies and previously separate functions become merged into single devices and systems. We'll be talking about some of the challenges and benefits of this and why it is critical to dealing with the complexity to our next generation infrastructure. Since the advent of early stone and wood tools, technology has become increasingly differentiated into specialized functions as today one can find many millions of technologies and services available on the market. Whenever we have a major technological transformation or new energy source like the advent of petroleum combustion, we get the emergence of a whole new ecosystem of technologies. If we look back at the development of new consumer technologies in the 20th century, it was largely a history of different ways to apply the newfound energy source of electricity and petroleum-based plastics, with the result being the proliferation of ever more consumer technologies filling ever more specialized functions. Today, we're on the edge of a new technology revolution in the form of nanotechnology, the engineering of physical systems on the scale of atoms, which is opening up a whole new dimension to our world that can be engineered and again, the proliferation of a new wave of technologies enabled by smart materials. And thus, this process of technological differentiation continues today, with ever more specialized technologies. But at the same time, the last few decades has also given rise to a quite radical technological convergence. Technology convergence is, as the name implies, the convergence of a number of disparate technologies or functions into a single integrated system. The internet and digital convergence are classical examples of this. Virtually all modes of telecommunications are rapidly converging upon the internet protocol as a single standard for telecommunications. Digital convergence refers to the merging of four distinct industries into one conglomerate information technology, telecommunications, consumer electronics, and entertainment. The digital format is driving rapid convergence as a previously disparate array of media, from books to television to films and photographs, are all converging upon a single format. Electricity cables are starting to become information transporters as the internet's infrastructure and power grids merge, and as cars become electrical, they too are becoming merged into the power grid. Some of the major factors behind this convergence that we'll be discussing are primarily the information revolution and service design, but also globalization and sustainable technologies. Information technology is central to this process of convergence as it is increasingly becoming the interface between people and the technology infrastructure that supports us. Devices, such as smartphones or tablets, allow us to access a wide variety of functions through a single interface. As we previously discussed, the Internet of Things is driving massive convergence of hugely disparate technologies, from tractors to washing machines to factories. They're all becoming operated through the Internet Protocol Suite and often accessible through mobile devices. And of course, behind all of this is the so-called cloud and computer virtualization, as data is converging into centralized data centers. This architecture to next generation IT, with on the one hand, the centralized systems of cloud computing, big data and analytics, and on the other, the massive proliferation of mobile devices and internet of things devices, is a good example of the complex interplay between increased convergence and divergence. As the CEO of Gardner, the IT research and consulting company put it, quote, in 2020, consumer IT and organization IT are one. Digital capabilities all throughout your enterprise are one. Digital is the business and the business is digital. 
The services revolution is an economic paradigm shift that moves the focus of economic activity from the provision of discrete products and technologies to providing end users with integrated services called product service systems. Within this paradigm, the focus is on the end user and providing them with not just a once-off product, but instead a seamless service experience. This is a much more sophisticated business and marketing model that adds value and differentiation. And it is aligned with the dominance of the services sector within post-industrial economies. The services revolution is a key factor leading to convergence in that it is focused on integrating disparate technologies into single seamless service experiences. Sustainability is also another driver of convergence, but more on the macro scale, as it requires us to focus on how different subsystems interoperate in order to make whole systems more efficient and sustainable over their full life cycle. Sustainable cities are urban environments that are able to identify how their different subsystems can work together. Again, this means designing integrated convergent systems. For example, this might involve asking how the structure of the urban environment relates to its transportation system and how their energy consumption relates to the city's air quality and so on. Again, this has a networking effect as we cut across traditional domains and it drives the convergence of different functions and silos onto common platforms. Lastly, globalization is also a factor here creating a geographical convergence as infrastructure systems no longer stop at borders but become networked on a multinational and regional or even global level. Information technology, financial and economic frameworks allow us to create multinational markets as something like electricity can be traded across borders seamlessly, creating interdependencies between previously autonomous national infrastructure systems. The best example of this being the European Union as it starts to create the regulatory frameworks for transportation and utility systems to span the entire continent. This process of rapidly increasing convergence creates both challenges and solutions within our technology infrastructure. On the positive side, we have dematerialization as convergence typically means we can do more with less physical resources required and dematerialization is very important to achieving sustainability. Convergence is also critical to dealing with the complexity of our next generation of technology, and it also enables seamless processes instead of discrete, siloed technologies and functions. But there are also many challenges, including the heightened complexity of engineering these multifunctional systems that requires a much higher level of abstraction Dealing with ill-defined borders and systems boundaries is another challenge involving increased security risk and ensuring basic functionality despite greater complexity is an added engineering challenge. We'll go over each of these separately. Convergence requires the use of significant abstraction. Abstraction is where the system as a whole becomes increasingly removed from any individual instance of its functionality. An example of this might be a computer's operating system. Early mainframe computers had no operating system. One simply wrote an application and put it into the computer to be run. And then the next person came along with their application and put that in. Of course, each of these application developers had to write lots of low-level code for maintaining the computer's hardware resources. Over time, the modern operating system evolved in order to provide a generic platform for performing basic common hardware resource management. The operating system provided a layer of abstraction so that the computer's hardware could be easily used for many different applications whilst also being independent of any particular instance of those applications. In order to enable convergence, new abstractions have to be invented. They have to work and be implemented. The complexity of designing and managing these complex systems is non-trivial. Convergence means our traditional well-defined borders become fuzzy. When things overlap, it is no longer clear who is responsible or whose jurisdiction we're in. 
Traditional regulation and management structures that were designed as domain-specific start to erode and appear less relevant. The overlapping and integration of many different systems and being able to access all of these systems through a single protocol creates significant security challenges. This interconnectivity and interdependence creates heightened risk of cascading failure. It becomes very difficult to understand and model all of the linkages and interdependencies within these complex networks. With convergence, the end user wants to be able to switch seamlessly between different functions and domains. Building firewalls, buffers and redundancy in order to reduce failure propagation often reduces their capacity to do this and thus security may become more of a concern and more difficult to implement. Abstraction is the engine behind convergence. As mentioned, these convergent technologies need many layers of abstraction in order to enable the many different functions they may be required to perform. Abstraction creates engineering challenges, but it also creates functionality challenges because it typically involves a much higher number of dependencies within the system. As the number of functions in a single device escalates, the ability of that device to serve its original basic function decreases. For example, the iPhone, which by its name implies that its basic functionality is that of a phone, can perform many different tasks, and thus the telephone's functionality is dependent upon many levels of abstraction involving millions of lines of code with many possible errors occurring. Compared to this, a simple monofunctional telephone will likely be much more reliable and trustworthy because it is monofunctional and involves a much lower level of abstraction. So these are some of the challenges to convergence. We'll now talk about some of its benefits. Convergence and abstraction are in many ways central to the solution space of dealing with the complexity to our industrial systems. As Oliver Holmes once said, quote, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Convergence is in many ways the only hope for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. These factors driving convergence, in particular product service systems, integrating technologies into seamless processes and information technology providing a single interface are critical to dealing with the complexity. They are central to encapsulating the complexity of next generation infrastructure and providing end users with integrated solutions. A corollary to this is that convergence enables processes instead of discrete functions we live in a world where we have to stay switching between devices and systems. With convergent technologies, functions can be stringed together into processes, and processes are really how our lives work, often quite simple ones, like going to pick up the children from school. You would interact with many technologies in the process of this activity, from our coat, to the house security system, to the car, to the transportation system, to one's mobile phone, and so on. All of these systems are completely ignorant of the fact that they are part of enabling some process. We spend our time continuously coordinating these different technologies into the processes that we're performing. Convergence through product service systems and information technology offers the possibility of taking us into a much more process oriented world. In this video, we've been talking about some of the drivers to the process of technology convergence. As IT and service design increasingly cut across and break down traditional silos between individual technologies and functional domains. We looked at some of the benefits and challenges to this process, including the creation of fuzzy borders, security issues and the challenges of increased abstraction. Convergence illustrates, once again, one of the major themes of complexity. That is a core tension between integration on the systems level and differentiation of the components on the local level. As our interface with these systems of technology may become integrated with functionality converging, while at the same time, underneath this, the actual technology that enables this may become increasingly differentiated and specialized. Two. Social media is a website 
application, or online channel that enables web users to create, co-create, discuss, modify, and exchange user-generated content. According to Nielsen, a global information and measurement company, Internet users spend more time in social media sites than any other type of site. With this, more and more advertisers use social media to promote their product. There are six types of social media. A. Social networks. These are sites that allow you to connect with other people with the same interests or background. Once user creates his or her account, he or she can set up a profile, add people, create groups, and share content. Examples. Facebook and Google Plus. B. Bookmarking sites. These are sites that allow you to store and manage links to various websites and resources. Most of these sites allow you to create a tag that allows you and others to easily search or share them. Examples. Stumble upon and Pinterest C. Social news. These are sites that allow users to post their own news items or links to other news sources. The users can also comment on the post and comments may also be ranked. They are also capable of voting on these news articles of the website. Those who get the most amount of votes are shown prominently. Examples, Reddit and DigD. Media sharing, these are sites that allow you to upload and share media content like images, music, and video. Most of these sites have additional social features like liking, commenting, and having user profiles. Examples, Flickr, YouTube, and Instagram. E. Microblogging, these are sites that focus on short updates from the user. Those subscribed to the user will be able to receive these updates. Examples, Twitter and Plurk. F. Blogs and Forums, these websites allow users to post their content. Other users are able to comment on the said topic. There are several free blogging platforms like Blogger, WordPress and Tumblr. On the other hand, forms are typically part of a certain website or web service. Right now, as we speak, we are on social media. Yes, that's right. YouTube is social media. A lot of you already know that. And a lot of you already know, or at least have a good understanding of what social media is. So let's find out. So I like to point out the fact that there's a lot of terms that are thrown around these days, social media, social network, and it's very convoluted. And I think that we should all use the term social media network just to clear up any confusion, but it's easier to just say social network. But if you look at it, I mean, there's social networks that don't have the media aspect. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Craigslist, I mean, technically that would be a social network. So there's a lot of overlap with all these things. And it's the media part that that makes it distinct because you have another media part of it that is where you're actually exchanging you know digital files so you can think of Netflix as a media website for video and Pandora as a media website for music okay so when you combine the social aspects and the media aspects you have the very gray area of a social media network okay and there's a lot of them so we're going to break them down uh, but all of them, the, the main idea is to connect with others. All right, so you can have a voice, you can you can say things, you can say a lot of things, and you can share a lot of things, share a lot of files, share a lot of thoughts, but with that comes privacy concerns, and that's where you hear about things like big data, which I'm going to talk about in another video. But it is a good way to stay up to date with whether it's you know global news, local news, your friends. I mean, uh, it's a good way to stay up to date, but there's emotional impacts with that, with, you know, people getting depressed by being on social media. And one of the ways to help you curb your social media use is there's actually an extension called block site, one word, where you can set up certain sites to be quote unquote blocked um, by yourself. So you can set up something like Facebook to be blocked when you try to access it to remind you that you shouldn't be on it because of your own choice but sometimes we get on autopilot and we go to these sites without even realizing it so an extension like that is very helpful so all the social media networks all right top 20 you got um, in terms of monthly users you got facebook with 2.23 billion monthly users okay it's a lot of people 
And Facebook owns WhatsApp and Messenger, which are number three and four on the list. They also own Instagram. Okay, so right off the bat, you got the number one social network, social media network, whatever we're going to call it, uh, has has four positions on this chart here. Uh, you know, we got Google number two here. And yeah, so there's all kinds of social networks. I put the ones in red that are ones that are outside of the U.S. Uh, a lot of them are big in China. And so, yeah, so that's one way of look at social, looking at social networks. Another way is the, the literal historical timeline. So I believe one of the first social networks was one called Six Degrees. But there was also AOL Instant Messenger, if you guys remember that, where it had a lot of social networking aspects and it was during this time that the whole idea got started. And in the early 2000s, there was a lot of new social networks like uh, MySpace and LinkedIn. And uh, you got Facebook coming in. And, you know, there's just an explosion in the, uh, I guess, in the 2000s or whatever we're calling that. I think we're calling the decade the thousands, which I think is cool. But, yeah, so a lot of these social media networks came out in the thousands, if you will. And so in the early two in the in the early tens, whatever we're gonna call this decade, it's kind of weird the time we live in. We don't even know what we're gonna call the decades, but I'm gonna call them the tens. In the early tens, we had sites like Snapchat coming out and the massive failure of Google Plus. And recently we got Telegram. So uh, they just they just keep on coming. And another way you can look at the social networks is the, the the content. So there are a lot of social networks that focus on a particular style of media. So something like Pinterest, you're sharing things like recipes and photos or photos of recipes. There's social networks where the main focus is to message each other. So something like WeChat or Telegram. And of course, there's the global networks and there's the failures. All right, failures like MySpace. MySpace is still around, but um, for all intents and purposes, is not nearly the giant it once was. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is break down some of the five more popular social networks out there, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. Without further ado, Facebook. Okay, Facebook is your classic social network. Facebook owns the apps I mentioned before, plus Oculus Rift. They own Oculus, the company. Okay, so just let that sink in. And and it's interesting to see where social um, networks can go, at least uh, Facebook. And up next we have Instagram, which is a photo sharing site. Uh, site. It's more of an app than anything. But uh, you can share photos and videos. Uh, very good for visual content. There's Twitter, which is kind of like having a, a big megaphone. We all know this from politicians and people getting their 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 thoughts out there. What else do we got? YouTube. Of course, YouTube. We're in YouTube right now. All right. So YouTube is obviously a video sharing site and I love it. And there's also LinkedIn, which is is the the quote unquote professional social media network where it's a way to get business contacts and if you're looking for a job supposedly it's a really good way to to connect with others and 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 find a job that way so so that's my breakdown of quote unquote social media and that's all I got so hope you have a good one and see you next time you're probably tired of hearing people say your business needs to be on social media without giving you any specifics as to what that means. Yeah, we're guilty of this too, but to make up for it, we've compiled a list of social media sites that you should try if you're not already using them. First, Facebook. It's been around for a while and reported an average of 2.5 billion monthly active users in December of 2019. Not million. Billion. Also in 2019, Facebook held over 80% of the US social referral share to e-commerce sites, meaning people are clicking through Facebook and landing in a place where they can make a purchase. 
Managing a Facebook page for your business is pretty straightforward. You can share text updates, images, videos, collect reviews, and interact with people who comment on your posts. This is essential to form relationships with your target audience. In addition, Facebook is an excellent tool for advertising. With Facebook ads, you can choose from a variety of ad types like video ads, slideshow ads, and photo ads. You also have access to really specific targeting options like people's interests or even life events. That includes people who just got married or had a baby and shared their life events on Facebook. Next up is Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. The two platforms are pretty similar. Both allow you to share photos and videos, including live videos, have TV features, and let users share temporary updates in the form of a story. Also like Facebook, Instagram is an important platform for engaging with your audience, and it has over 1 billion accounts you can potentially engage with. You can share content created by fans of your brand and interact with people who have interacted with you. The advertising options are just as good as Facebook's. You can target people by specific things like their interests, behaviors, or create your own audience list based on the information you've collected. I don't want to say you can't go wrong with Instagram just because it's very visual and might not be right for every business, but there are a lot of businesses that have seen success on the platform. It really depends on things like your industry and your target audience. The third social media site I want to discuss is LinkedIn. LinkedIn has over 660 million users, and it's not just for people on the hunt for a new job. Yes, LinkedIn is good for recruiting potential applicants. You can really show off your culture, your knowledge, and your accomplishments to entice potential applicants. But that's not all you can do. LinkedIn is a platform of business professionals, so if your business is B2B, you can tap into potential leads and sales by posting about your products and services. LinkedIn also offers advertising options, and you can target people based on their company information, like titles, fields of study, and industry. With access to targeting capabilities like that, you know it can be an advertising powerhouse for B2B. Okay, next is Twitter. Hashtag WebFX, hashtag follow us, hashtag shameless plugs. But seriously, Twitter reports an average of over 150 million daily active users who can see ads on the platform. Like the other platforms, you can share text updates, photos, and videos, with a character limit of course. Twitter's fast-paced nature makes it a great platform for establishing brand authority and giving quick company updates. Twitter also has its own advertising options with the ability to target people based on their tweets, who they follow, or even their interests. Hashtag next platform. Number five on this list is Pinterest. Pinterest is like a digital vision board that 250 million people use every month. It's a really big vision board. If your business sells products online, Pinterest is a great place to put them. People can pin them to their boards and even have the option of shopping right from the platform. You can also use Pinterest to advertise your business and target people based on their interests, keywords they search, and more. Finally, and this is a personal favorite of mine, YouTube. People watch more than 1 billion hours of video each day on YouTube. Having an active YouTube channel can really benefit your business. You can share your industry knowledge, give people a behind the scenes look at your business, introduce your team, show off your products, and interact with users who engage with your videos. YouTube also has a variety of advertising options. Since Google owns YouTube, you have a bunch of different targeting options for your ads like demographics, interests, and remarketing. Totally tubular. 3. Mobile technologies The popularity of smartphones and tablets has taken a major rise over the years. This is largely because of the device capability to do tasks that were originally found in personal computers. Several of these devices are capable of using high-speed internet. Today, the latest mobile devices use 4 grams networking, LTE, which is currently the fastest mobile network. Also, mobile devices use different operating systems, a. iOS, used in Apple devices such as the iPhone and iPad. b. Android, an open source operating system developed by Google. Being open source means several mobile companies use this OS for free. c. BlackBerry OS, used in BlackBerry devices. d. Windows Phone OS, 
a closed source and proprietary operating system developed by Microsoft Registered Trademark. E. Symbian, the original smartphone OS. Used by Nokia devices. F. WebOS, originally used for smartphones. Now used for smart TVs. G. Windows Mobile, developed by Microsoft Registered Trademark for smartphones and pocket PCS. Before cell phones, there were car phones. Good morning, Mr. Cardinal. How did the market open? In fact, the original car phone weighed about 80 pounds. In 1947, an engineer at Bell Labs envisioned a futuristic phone network for their car phones. A call would bounce uninterrupted between cells of coverage. At the time, the technology and the infrastructure for this did not exist, but it soon would. The car phones quickly became popular despite their limitations. Only a limited number of people could use the service at a time, which meant five to 10 year waiting lists began to form. And existing customers could sometimes wait up to 30 minutes to place a call. But then in 1973, Motorola engineer Martin Cooper showed what the future would look like, the Dynatac 8000X. Based on Bell's cell network concept, it was the world's first handheld cell phone. 10 years and a $100 million investment later, Motorola finally released the phone to the public. I'd like to order a large pizza with mushrooms, anchovies, and the hottest peppers you can find. The decade-long delay was caused by the need to build the cellular infrastructure the phone required to operate. The phone took 10 hours to charge, lasted 35 minutes, and cost $3,995, which would be about $10,000 today. Industry watchers say there are only a few thousand cellular phones in use right now, but that number is expected to grow considerably within the next few years. During the cellular revolution. Ahead of its time, the IBM Simon could be considered the world's first smartphone, the world's first touchscreen phone, and the first phone to have software apps. It cost around $1,099 new, which would be around $1,800 today. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. But what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Just one month after one of the most popular BlackBerry devices was released, the original iPhone hit shelves nationwide. It would go on to sell more than 6 million units, with new models introduced every year. The iPhone would forever change mobile phones the computer industry, and technology forever. Today's cell phones are a far cry from the $10,000 Dynatac phone of 1983. And for many people, the phone feature has become one of the least used features. But in the future, phones could make another drastic change. The World Economic Forum thinks the first implantable phones will become commercially available by 2024.
Assistive Media is a non-profit service designed to help people who have visual and reading impairments. A database of audio recordings is used to read to the user. You may visit this link for several of their audio recordings. My name is Lizeth Torres and I've been here at REACH for almost 10 years. I'm an assistive technology specialist. Um, assistive technology is any tool, item, or piece of equipment that is used to maintain or increase the functional capabilities of an individual with disabilities. So assistive technology could be any um, item or piece of equipment. It could be um, low-tech, mid-tech, or high-tech. So an example of a low-tech tool would be something like a communication board, it could be a walker, or it could be a pencil grip. A mid-tech device is something that requires a battery source. So your high-tech devices are going to be your more complex devices. They're usually a lot more expensive and they require the most training and the most support to use that device. So assessing the needs and abilities for AT requires determining um, the means of access. So for example, are they going to use a direct selection or an indirect selection to access the device? So an example of direct selection would be pointing with or without physical support, or for example, using your finger to point um, or using a stylus to point. And an, an example of an indirect selection would be using a scanner or a switch to access your device. When setting up a system for an individual, it's important to determine the symbol, the size of the display, and the icon. Determining the icon means figuring out what size you actually want the icon to be. Um, do you want a two by two square, a four by four square? Determining the symbol relates to, you know, are they gonna use real objects? Are they gonna use photos, color photos, or written words? and determining the size of the display uh, relates to figuring out how much they can handle on a display. So for example, are you gonna have a board that only has two choices or do you want a board that has 60 choices? So it really just depends on the individual and where their skills are at. There are many tools available that help us assess individuals for acquiring communication systems. Um, one tool that we like to use is called um, AAC Genie. It helps you identify if a person is able to identify symbols, if they need photos as opposed to written words, also if they're able to create a sentence or not. It also helps identify the size of the display, so if a person can handle only two options on a display as opposed to 50 or 60. Once we gather all the information, um, then again we build a framework and then that helps us figure out what the next step is in um, building a communication system for the person. So I think that once another person sees an individual with a device or technology or a even a communication board, it invites for communication and it invites for relationships and it invites you know, to be more of a group setting and um, it doesn't single people out. Assistive technologies for the inclusion of people with disabilities in society, education and jobs is the title of a scientific foresight study which has been conducted for the STOA panel of the European Parliament. STOA stands for Science and Technology Options Assessment. The project focused on the potential of assistive technologies for three types of disabilities. Blindness and visual impairment, deafness and hearing impairment, and Autism Spectrum Disorders, or ASD. What are assistive technologies, or ATs? ATs are, in the words of the World Health Organization, assistive products and related systems and services developed to maintain or improve functioning and thereby promote well-being. This means that ATs are technologies which can assist a person in doing something that otherwise this person would not be able to do or would have difficulties with. 
ATs can provide different kinds of support. For blind people, ATs are often based on tactile communication like braille, or sounds to replace images, text-to-speech devices, or technology to assist mobility. For deaf people, ATs can increase the sound level, for instance by means of hearing aids, or replace the sound by images or vibration-like visual alerting devices. For ASD, ATs are often designed to overcome barriers in communication. Here, augmentative and alternative communication technologies have been developed like speech generating devices. ATs can be medical devices, but it is also possible to use mainstream technologies for assistive purposes. For example, GPS navigators with voice interfaces are often used by blind people. Video phones for sign language users and video games can be used by people with ASD to simulate and prepare for daily specific situations. Currently, people with disabilities face a wide range of barriers. These include, for instance, physical and communication barriers, but also social barriers. There are many expectations regarding the benefits for people with disabilities in society connected with the use of ATs, since they can support people with disabilities to overcome the challenges they face. For instance, concerning the challenges in independent living. The hopes connected to ATs are related to an active and independent participation into social life, or as one blind IT expert put it during the project, being able to integrate in society to do what you need to do independently. This is what assistive technologies bring us. Independence. Not having to ask for help for specific tasks to friends or family. The concept of universal design is crucial to ensure that ATs can serve everybody in society and that they can be connected with a wide range of user interface devices. Currently, the European Accessibility Act is being negotiated at European level, aiming to ensure that technical devices will be universal, interoperable and accessible for all. And what are the challenges in education? Participating fully in education is crucial to deal with the challenges of a digitalized world, as well as for the further active participation in employment. Students with disabilities are in need of educational support tools. IT technologies, for instance, have a prominent role for the inclusion of students into the educational system. In the words of an expert from industry, many aspects of education are currently provided through computers. Students need to have these assistive technologies, but the content and the platform have to be accessible. People without disabilities also need to be educated. Professionals dealing with ATs, for instance, in healthcare or public services, like police staff or teachers, technology developers or web specialists, they all need to be more aware of the specific needs of people with disabilities and how technology can support them. Many experts recommend that a new profession, the assistive technology professional, should be introduced to help manage the specifics and complexity of ATs. What are the challenges in employment? Experts agree that ATs can be of high importance at the workplace regardless of the disability. Technology can be very useful in the employment world, where technology can help make the labour market more disability friendly. Specific needs for ATs at the workplace can be, for instance, for the visually impaired, full access to all IT applications, including pictures. For the hearing impaired, web-based sign language interpretation. For people with ASD, augmented reality applications to simulate and train for real-life situations at the workplace. Despite the many technologies and information sources available, the inclusion of people with disabilities into the labour market still faces many attitudinal barriers and prejudices remain. These already start at the recruitment phase and continue through later stages of employment. What are the key future challenges of ATs? Many challenges lay ahead of us. These include the development of new technical solutions like bionic eyes and robot assistance. At least as important is the careful ethical, social and economic assessment of these technologies. ATs can already play an essential role in supporting people with disabilities to overcome the barriers they face. But society also needs to change so that we can overcome the attitudinal and social barriers still existing towards people with disabilities. Hello guys, welcome to our tutorial series. I am Teacher William, and in today's video, we are going to study the trends in information and communications technology. 
this topic covers in our subject, Empowerment Technology. So, are you now ready? The Trends in ICT As the world of ICT continues to grow, the industry has focused on several innovation. These innovations cater to the needs of the people that benefit most out of ICT. Whether it is for business or personal use, these trends are the current front-runners in the innovation of ICT. So here are the current trends in ICT. We have number 1. Technological convergence. 2. Social media. 3. Mobile technologies. And 4. Assistive media. Let us explore the four current trends in ICT. The Technological Convergence Technological convergence is an evolution of technological developments that merge into a new system bringing together different types of applications and media. Interaction with seamless synergy between various applications and media are now possible because of technological innovations. The smartphone is an example of technological convergence as it provides functionality of various individual separate and different devices now available in one gear. The smartphone can function as a telephone, camera, radio, TV, and gaming console. All of these tasks were only available and usable on a singular and different gadget. The Internet is the single most important example of technological convergence as almost all types of entertainment such as TV, radio, books, movies, games and so on are all available online. In short, technological convergence is a technology that allow users to access all these information in one device, in one's preferred space and time. Let us proceed to the second trend in information and communications technology which is the social media. Social media is a collection of internet-based communication tools and computer-assisted channels dedicated to allow users to interact, communicate, and share information in a virtual community and network. There are six types of social media. We have a. Social network. b. Bookmarking sites. c. Social news. d. Media sharing. e. Microblogging. and f. Blogs and forum. Let us explore these types of social media before we proceed to the next trend in ICT. The social network. Social networks are the sites that allow you to connect with other people with the same interests or background. Once the user creates his or her account, he or she can set up a profile, add people, create groups, and share content. Examples of social networks, we have Facebook and Google+. The bookmarking sites. These are sites that allow you to store and manage links to various website and resources. Most of these sites allow you to create a tag that allows you and others to easily search or share them. Examples, StumbleUpon and Pinterest. Next we have the social news. Social news are sites that allow users to post their own new items or links to other new sources. In social news, users can also comment on the post and comments may also be ranked. They are also capable of voting on these news articles of the website. Those who get the most amount of votes are shown most prominently. Examples we have Reddit and Dig. Next is the media sharing. Media sharing are sites that allow you to upload and share media content like images, music and video. Most of these sites have additional social features or liking, commenting, and having user profiles. Examples, Flickr, YouTube, and Instagram. Next is the microblogging. Microblogging are sites that focus on short updates from the user. Those subscribed to the user will be able to receive their updates. Examples, Twitter and Plurk. Lastly, we have, blogs and forums. Blogs and forums are websites that allow users to post their content. Other users are able to comment on the said topic. There are several free blogging platforms like Blogger, WordPress, and Tumblr. On the other hand, forums are typically part of a certain websites or web pages. Now, let us proceed to the third trend in information and communications technology which is the mobile technologies. Okay, so, with the growing mobile technologies, the smartphone has dominated sales growth of the digital world, outpacing laptops and personal computers. Smartphone is an integration of various technologies rolled into one, such as cellular phone, portable digital assistant or PDA, and video camera. 
The inherent portability and reduced size of the smartphone allow people to capture, write, share, and communicate to anyone and anywhere as long as there is an internet connectivity or cellular signal. Smartphone has also been used as a game console, in watching videos, and in listening to the music. Nowadays, the latest mobile devices use 5G or the fifth generation network that can provide higher performance and improved efficiency empower new user experiences and connects new industries. Also, mobile devices use different operating systems, we have letter A. iOS which is used in Apple devices such as the iPhone and iPad. B. Android which is an open source system developed by Google. Being open source means several mobile phone companies use this OS for free. C. The BlackBerry OS which used in BlackBerry devices. D. The Windows Phone OS which is a closed source and proprietary operating system developed by Microsoft. E. The Symbian. This is the original smartphone OS, used by Nokia devices. F. The Web OS which is originally used for smartphones, now used for smart TVs. And lastly, we have letter G, Windows Mobile which developed by Microsoft smartphones and pocket PCs. And now, the last trend in information and communications technology, we have, the assistive media. Assistive media is a non-profit organization founded in 1966 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA, which designed to help people who have visual and reading impairment. A database recordings is used to read to the user. And that concludes our lesson for today. If this is the summary of our lesson for today. ICT is a composite term, which embodies three important concepts. Those three concepts are information, communication and technology. Put together, therefore, ICT has been defined as, the acquisition, analysis, manipulation, storage and distribution of information and the design and provision of equipment and software. Information and Communications Technology or ICT plays an integral part in the development of the Philippine economy. The Philippines is dubbed as the ICT hub of Asia. When Tim Berners-Lee created the Internet, most web pages were static, which are now referred to as Web 1.0. A static web page is a page that has content that the user cannot manipulate. On the other hand, a dynamic web page Introduced in Web 2.0, is a page where its content depend on the user or the website visitor. There are several key features of Web 2.0, namely, folksonomy, rich user experience, user participation, long-tail services, software as a service, and a mass participation. Folksonomy deals with the information tagging. Rich user experience deals with how a site uses user information for a personalized content. User participation means that those who view the website can also put their own information. Long-tail services offer services on demand as opposed to a one-time purchase. Software as a service contain how users would subscribe to a software as opposed to purchasing them. And mass participation deals with the diverse information sharing through universal web access. Web 3.0 aims to improve on Web 2.0 by adding user-specific content through universal user preferences. However, the realization of Web 3.0 is hampered by several problems, namely, compatibility, security vastness, vagueness, and logic. The trends in ICT include convergence, social media, mobile technologies, and assistive learning. Activity 1.1 Static versus Dynamic Instruction Look for 10 websites and classify them as static or dynamic. What makes each website static or dynamic? Use the table below. Activity 1.2 Identifying the correct web platform for social change 1. Identify a problem in your community, for example, littering, garbage disposal, block drainages, etc. 2. Imagine that you are going to create a website to persuade both community leaders and members to solve this problem. 3. Fill out the form below. You may refer to the sample provided after the form. Community problem, vicinity campaign name, type of social media used, website used, what will be the content of your social media site? Why did you choose that type of social media?
Why did you choose that website? Example form, community problem, severe flooding during rainy days due to block drainages. Vicinity, Lapis St. Oleander Village, Barangay Pula Quezon City. Campaign name, anti-flooding movement, type of social media used, blogging, website used, WordPress. What will be the content of your social media site? It will contain pictures of the flooded area during rainy days. It will also contain pictures of the drainages that are blocked with garbage. I also plan to update it every once in a while. Anyone who views the site will be able to comment on these updates. Why did you choose that type of social media? People in my community are avid readers of blogs. Most of them follow several blogs that concern the community. Why did you choose that website? WordPress, unlike other blogging platforms, has a more serious feel to it. It also contains professional-looking templates that will fit the series tone of my campaign. That would be all for our session today. Hungang Samuli Nutting Pachkakita. God bless you all.